So, one of the most misunderstood uh, ex mind experiments in the history of cognitive science or I guess AI and other things is what's called the Chinese room experiment. This is a, a thought experiment coined by um, uh, John Searle. It, it is John Searle, right? Like for some reason I'm like misremembering it. Mr. Searle, Dr. Searle. Um, and I think it's one of the most important mind experiments in uh, for everyone nowadays, especially when everyone's talking about AI and computers and all this kind of uh, trash, right? Um, I, I don't want to speak disparagingly, but uh, stuff. So the question is this, okay, can a machine think? Um, now that that's obviously depends on what machine is, what think is, um, but uh, to say it more clearly, when you are talking to an AI, when you, when it is giving you responses, does the fact that the AI can creatively respond to your input, does that make it a conscious being? The, does that make it so that it understands what it's saying? It seems to understand what it's saying. It's producing English in a kind of creative way that makes it seem like it knows what's going on. But is it actually? Or obviously this is a, a question of, uh, you know, it's kind of a philosophical question, like can you have, well, uh, let me step back actually, because maybe I'm even saying it's a little more than what it actually is. What the Chinese room experiment is, it's a, cr a critique of the computational theory of mind, or at least the computational theory of mind with respect to consciousness, okay? So, um, it, it's very simple. Let's say this. Suppose there is a room, and it has John Searle in the room, and there's a big book in front of him, okay? Now, in this room, uh, there's, a, there's a little, uh, I guess, a place where you can put, like, mail inside, and there's a place where you can, you know, put mail from the inside to go out, right? So there's an input and there's an output, okay? So what can happen in this room is a Chinese person can come, and he can write any sentence in Chinese, anything he wants, and he can input it into this room. He can, he can slide it in through the mail hole, okay? Then John Searle, or whoever is in the Chinese room, he can take that Chinese input. Now, he doesn't know Chinese, okay? Uh, this is a non-Chinese speaker, but he can use the giant book in front of him um, to look up for, you know, for this sequence of characters respond this way, okay? Now, this has to be, in, in real life, this would be an extremely complex book, probably bigger than the whole room. You'd have to have lots of ifs and elses and stuff like that, but this is just a mind experiment, right? So suppose that we have, uh, John Searle can do that. He can write a response in Chinese, and then he can send the response to the person outside. So the question is this. Now, the, the, the Chinese room as a system, including John Searle and the book and the room itself with the, the input and output, uh, mail feeds, um, it, c it might be able to speak Chinese in a very, uh, let's say, uh, it might be very fluent at Chinese. It might uh, know t how to tell jokes and be like a really affable guy, you know, so to speak, right? You might input some Chinese if you're a Chinese speaker, and the room as a system might respond in a very clever way. Now, Searle simply says this, is the room conscious of Chinese? Does the room know Chinese? Does it understand the semantics of Chinese? When I say that I know English, okay, that doesn't just mean that I can put English word, you know, you say something in English and I respond in English words. I actually understand what I'm saying. I know uh, that these words are not just symbols, right? I, I have a perception of the feel of each word, not just like as, as something like phonetic, but what the word means, what it corresponds to in real life. And ultimately, when I'm responding in English, uh, my, my whole consciousness, in a way, is giving a, a meaningful response based on reality, right? That, that tie between symbols and reality, that is mediated by semantics, that's mediated by consciousness. Now, Sur Searle says, it's very clear in this situation, the room itself is not conscious, okay? Very much isn't. Uh, John Searle, who's in the room, He's not conscious of Chinese. He does, he does, now, he's a conscious person, but he is not conscious of Chinese, right? He, is not, he does not know Chinese because he's looking this stuff up in a book, right? Uh, the book is not conscious of Chinese. It doesn't know Chinese. Yes, you can look up a bunch of symbols in it, and it will give you, as a person, directions uh, for how to respond. But the book itself does not know Chinese. And the whole system itself... The room, it, it doesn't have a consciousness of the Chinese language. It doesn't understand 
uh, the relationship between the symbols and uh, uh, what they actually mean. And Searle, of course, uses this as an example to say, just because you are computing something does not mean, uh, or just because you have the syntax of something and you respond in a understandable way, a way comprehensible to someone who understands semantics, that doesn't mean that you have the semantics. That doesn't mean that you understand it, okay? That doesn't mean that you are even an entity. It, in the same way, let's say, for example, in AI, uh, uh, your modern day AIs, are they conscious? Or do they know the languages they speak? No, they don't. No, no, they don't. I mean, you can make some kind of, well, I, I want to be clear, actually, Searle is not arguing, no, they don't. But what he is arguing is that the fact that they use language, the fact that they seem to use language in a way that's familiar to us, that they're producing results that seem to indicate they know something, does not mean that they're conscious. It's totally irrelevant, okay? Um, that, that has nothing to do, whereas, and you might say, like, well, isn't that duh? Like, is, isn't that, like, definitely true? Well, no, because there is this, this uh, perspective called the computational theory of mind. And the idea there is that computation is just the essence of the brain. Like, when our, our knowledge, our consciousness, it's almost like a free rider on the computation of the brain. The computation produces the, uh, the, the meaning, right? It, it produces, like, um, your consciousness is a... Uh, almost like an epiphenomenon, an emergent property of your physical brain doing uh, computation. And Searle is saying, no, that is, it's, it's something different. We don't, he doesn't know exactly how it works. Searle, you know, he's like a, I, I think he's a materialist, very much an atheist, right? He doesn't believe in, uh, you know, some kind of spiritual thing that de uh, descends on a, a physical brain. But he is saying that the physical brain, in the way that we understand it, in the computation, in the syntactic computation that we do, that by itself is not sufficient to give you an understanding of consciousness and of semantics, right? Now, I will go ahead and say that I think if you take that argument seriously, and again, as I said, Searle is a, a materialist, uh, I believe, I believe is an atheist, I'm nearly certain about that. Um, I think if you really take that seriously, you, you do have to go a little bit further and say that Whatever consciousness is, okay, it is not physical, okay? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that at all. That's not his argument. But I would say that if, you are, if your materialistic view of the universe is one of, let's say, physical computation, atoms bumping into each other, all this kind of stuff, if you create a, a, a universe where you merely have atoms and material forces and all this kind of stuff, there's never... A, it, it's, it's kind of like... You know, that, that's almost like a, let's say, a spiritually 2D world. And you're never going to have something 3D on top of that. You know what I mean? You're not going to produce from that syntactic com computation so this new layer of consciousness, this new layer of understanding. And I, I think really, again, Searle doesn't, Searle doesn't endorse this. Okay, I'm not, not trying to say this is what the Chinese room experiment says. But I think if you really take that intuition to its conclusion, expand that where I think it's, it's warranted, you will probably actually come to the conclusion that whatever consciousness is, again, whether you're an atheist or whatever, consciousness has to be just a different substance than matter. It, 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 is, it is as inherent to the universe, it is as inherent to human existence, you know, the soul, whatever you want to say, that is something that is distinct from matter. It has to be. Now, it interacts, it clearly interacts with matter. You know, you bump your head, you go unconscious, right? It clearly interacts with it. There's no doubt about that, you know, but... It is not the same thing. Now, anyway, back to the Chinese room experiment. Again, Searle doesn't say that. The issue with the Chinese room experiment, uh, or, or the, the parable of it, is that so many people just don't understand it, or don't, or, or like seriously like misunderstand it. You know, like um, there's a really funny. I'll link it if it's um, if uh, I don't know. It's available online, but um, Searle has this really good book, and I totally recommend it. It's usually uh, like five dollars. It's really small. It's called The Mystery of Consciousness, and he actually goes through, uh, not just talking about his, um, uh, his Chinese room, whatever, but he also talks about different views of consciousness. And the best part of that book is the interaction that he has, a back and forth he has with Daniel Dennett, who's this, uh, who used to, he died, but Daniel Dennett is this awful philosopher. I don't know, I don't know why anyone, like, I, I don't know. But I, I think if you read that book, if, I, I'm sure a lot of you guys know who Daniel Dennett is. You will understand what, what I mean by he's an awful philosopher when you, you read this book and you actually see his interaction 
uh, with um, Searle because, you know, as Searle says, like, Daniel Dennett and a lot of people of that ilk, right, ultimately, they, they, I, I think Searle puts it like, they deny the data of consciousness. They say qualia do not exist. Consciousness is almost like an illusion, right? or, which is weird because you can't really have an illusion if you don't even have consciousness. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of a strange thing to say, but, uh, you know, uh, Dennett, he's kind of couched in behaviorism and, and this uh, uh, objective science, which if you really take that idea of objective, objectively verifiable science seriously, you have to come to the conclusion that your internal world, which is actually the only thing you experience, doesn't exist because you can't objectively prove it. And I think that's kind of where Dennett, uh, where Dennett, uh, uh, comes to this like totally bizarre, uh, I don't know, maybe he's an NPC, I don't know, maybe he doesn't know what we're talking about when we're talking about consciousness, maybe that's why he'd be like, I don't, well, he's dead now, so, you know, uh, who knows, um, maybe he's finding out if he was an NPC or not, um, either way, so, um, uh, the, the, the Chinese room, though, and I, I mean, like, a lot of the people you read about this, uh, read it from Searle, read his article, read that book, I highly recommend it, um, but a, nearly every other person who's talked about this, including smart people who are famous, um, it, it's like none of them understand. Daniel didn't un, Daniel didn't 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 understand it. Douglas Hofstadter, the guy who wrote GEB, he actually wrote a bunch of stuff with Dennett, uh, like arguing, like just like totally misunderstanding uh, the Chinese room. I, uh, Steven Pinker, who wrote this one good book, The Blank Slate, and then a bunch of awful ones, and even The Blank Slate, people are far past that red pill at this point. But Steven Pinker just like totally doesn't understand. Like I, one of them, I forget which one. Maybe it was like um, Dennett. He talks about like, oh well, Searle just argues that like, um, or maybe it was Pinker. I forget. Uh, Searle just argues that um, uh, the brain like ex uh, exudes uh, con like consciousness is some kind of uh, uh, goo that's exuded by the brain or something. It's, it's not what the argument it is at all. Ultimately, it is. It's a critique of this um, this this way of looking at the brain. Uh, or way of looking at AI, by the same token, where you think that because something is doing a computation, it must be conscious of what that computation means to us, which obviously, it's a total non sequitur. Um, as I said in my video on AI just uh, 10 minutes ago, or whenever I was recording that, uh, <laughs> I'll probably release it like two weeks uh, difference or something like that. But when I was recording that video, um, you know, I said the issue with AI is that like it appears as an illusion to us like it, it looks like something It looks like the, there's more going on here and going on there than actually is, you know uh, But that's not the case. It's just not the case and uh, again your interpretation of like what consciousness actually is that is not talked about by the Chinese room experiment It is really just a way of thinking uh, you know, it's just a, just a reminder that syntax is not semantics. They're two different things. Uh, computation is not the same thing as consciousness. They're not the same thing. Um, they might be correlated. They are correlated. There are lots of things they have to do with each other, uh, but they're not just not the same thing. And it is, it's it's bad science. It's bad philosophy. It's bad spiritually to think that to reduce the entire uh, uh, human cognitive realm to computation because that's not what's going on. There's a lot more going on. Just because we don't understand it in materialist science at this point, that's not an argument. All right.